Earlier this month, the Russian space agency Roscosmos ended its partnership with the British company OneWeb, which used Soyuz rockets to launch their telecommunications satellites into orbit. Roscosmos demanded that OneWeb guarantee that the satellites launched into orbit will not be used for military purposes and that the British government divest its entire stake in OneWeb. The British authorities refused to comply with these demands and broke off cooperation with Russia within the framework of the OneWeb project. It has now become known that, in the future, OneWeb satellites will be delivered into orbit by SpaceX's Falcon 9 rockets. The New Deal puts SpaceX in the unique position of launching satellites that could compete with its own Starlink satellites in the space-based internet business. OneWeb is currently marketing its services to businesses rather than directly to consumers, as SpaceX does with Starlink. It is expected that the first launch under this cooperation will be carried out at the end of 2022. To date, 428 OneWeb telecommunications satellites have been delivered to the Earth's orbit, while the company plans to create a constellation of 648 satellites. According to recent reports, SpaceX intends to raise prices for various products and services, including rocket launches and Starlink satellite internet, citing high inflation as a result of the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict. For example, the cost of launching SpaceX's workhorse Falcon 9 rocket has risen from $62 million to $67 million, and booking a flight of the company's massive Falcon Heavy launcher now costs $97 million, up from $90 million previously. In both cases, this represents a roughly 8% increase. Furthermore, the company is now charging $1.1 million to deliver 200 kilograms of rideshare payload to sun-synchronous orbit and $5,500 for each additional kilogram above that. The previous rideshare prices were $1 million for 200 kilograms and $5,000 for each additional kilograms. SpaceX's Starlink satellite broadband service, which now has a quarter of a million subscribers, is also affected by inflation. SpaceX recently sent notices to Starlink users and deposit holders noting the higher prices. Starlink's base monthly service fee will rise by 11% to $110 per month, up from $99 per month, beginning May 21. For users who have placed a deposit but are on SpaceX's waiting list for service, the price of the basic Starlink hardware will increase by 10% to $549 from $499. The company raised the base hardware price for new orders by 20% to $599 from $499. Users who wish to cancel service due to price changes can do so without a fee, but they will only receive a full refund if they received the Starlink hardware within the last 30 days. Otherwise, users who cancel within the first year of service will receive a partial refund of $200. NASA astronaut Jell Lindgren announced on March 23 that SpaceX's brand new Dragon capsule to carry astronauts to space had been named Freedom, bringing the name of the first capsule to fly an American into space to a new generation. Alan Shepard, the first American to fly to space was traveled aboard NASA's Mercury Redstone 3, also known as Freedom 7. Shepard chose the name Freedom based on the Cold War space race between the United States and the then-Soviet Union. Now, 61 years later, on April 19, SpaceX's crew four astronauts, Jell Lindgren, Bob Hines, Jessica Watkins, and Samantha Cristoforetti, will fly from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida to the International Space Station aboard another U.S. spacecraft named Freedom. Freedom will be SpaceX's fourth Dragon capsule to transport astronauts into space. The other three are Endeavor, Resilience, and Endurance, which were also named by the first crew members to ride them. The company aims to use each spacecraft at least five times for crewed missions. On March 23, two astronauts at the International Space Station exited the orbiting laboratory for a six-and-a-half-hour spacewalk. Flight engineers Raja Chari of NASA and Matthias Maurer of the European Space Agency were the astronauts assigned to the spacewalk. This was the second spacewalk of the month to upgrade the orbiting laboratory. The first one was carried out by Raja Chari and NASA astronaut Caleb Barron on March 15 to prepare the space station for upcoming solar array upgrades by assembling and installing modification kits. So far, two of six ISS rollout solar arrays, or IROSes, have been deployed on the station, with four additional arrays to be delivered. The arrays will ultimately augment six of the station's eight power channels. They have a capacity of 120 kilowatts and will increase the station's power generation by 20 to 30 percent. On Wednesday, Mora and Chari completed their major objective of installing hoses on a radiator beam valve module that routes ammonia through the station's heat-rejecting radiators to keep systems at the proper temperature. 
The crew members also installed a power and data cable on the Columbus module's Bartolomeo science platform, replaced an external camera on the station's truss, and conducted other upgrades to station hardware. It was the 248th spacewalk in support of space station assembly, upgrades and maintenance, and was the second in Chari's career and the first for more. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. After months of delays and numerous rumors regarding the fate of Starship 20 and Booster 4, Elon Musk recently shared new information about the first orbital Starship flight. According to him, SpaceX will use Raptor version 2 engines for Starship's first orbital flight. These engines are more reliable, robust, and visually simpler than Raptor version 1 engines. Notably, Booster 4 and Ship 20 are powered by earlier Raptor engines, implying that the pair will not be the first to reach orbit, as had seemed likely for several months. While Musk's tweet confirms that Booster 4 and Ship 20 will not be used for the orbital launch, it does not specify which booster ship combination will take that historic flight. SpaceX appears to be planning to launch Booster 7 and Ship 24 for the test flight, but this is purely speculative. The vehicles are currently in production at the Starbase build site, and they feature a wide range of design changes, including significantly modified header tanks, an entirely new nose cone design, new layouts for secondary systems, and more. Most importantly, the thrust structures of both Booster 7 and Ship 24 have been modified to accommodate new Raptor version 2 engines, rather than the Raptor version 1 engines that have previously been installed and tested on all Starship and Super Heavy prototypes. Please see the links in the description for more information on these design tweaks. Despite the fact that SpaceX is rapidly developing Starship, Super Heavy Booster, and Raptor engines for the upcoming flight test, SpaceX must first obtain an orbital launch license from the Federal Aviation Administration, which is contingent on the launch site's programmatic environmental assessment report. The assessment ensures safe space flight operations and evaluates the potential environmental impacts of SpaceX's Starship development program. The FAA announced on Friday that they need an extension until April 29 to complete the final environmental review, including responses to comments, as well as complete consultation and coordination with local, state, and federal agencies. It has to be noted that the completion of the environmental review process does not guarantee that the FAA will issue an experimental permit to SpaceX for Starship Super Heavy launches at Boca Chica. SpaceX's license application must also meet FAA safety, risk, and financial responsibility requirements. Though there is currently a delay in the environmental process required for Starship to take its orbital flight, this is not the only factor impeding SpaceX's launch from Starbase. According to Elon Musk, the 39-flight worthy Raptor version 2 engines will be ready only by April, and then it will take a month to integrate them onto the booster and Starship. His timeline has him hopeful for the orbital flight test to take place in May. However, this timeline does not include the extensive ground testing that Ship 24 and Booster 7 must complete before they are qualified for flight, which includes cryogenic proof tests, wet dress rehearsals, and a few static fire tests. In fact, SpaceX has only conducted a single three-engine static fire test with an entirely outdated Super Heavy prototype up to this point. So, for the company to be confident in its booster design, the upgraded prototype will need to go through a lengthy testing campaign that progresses from igniting a few engines to igniting all 33 Raptors. As a result, a May launch is highly unlikely, and we may have to wait until June to witness the nerve-wracking flight of the Starship and Super Heavy combo. Given the current circumstances, we can almost predict what will happen to Ship 20 and Booster 4. Ship 20 was destacked from Booster 4 on the 19th of March, with the assistance of the tower arms. Five days later, a crane was used to remove Booster 4 from the launch platform. So far, Ship 20 has completed four static fire tests, and Ship 20 and Booster 4 have completed approximately a dozen cryoproof tests together. It's highly unlikely that SpaceX will conduct further tests on these prototypes. Soon, the ship and booster will be taken back to the construction site and then placed at the rocket garden. For the time being, SpaceX is preparing Ship 24 sections for stacking and appears to be finalizing Booster 7, which could easily be ready for cryo-proof testing within a few weeks. Cryo-tests will be followed by Raptor version 2 engine installation and the start of static fire testing. In April 2021, NASA picked SpaceX to build the first crewed lunar lander based on Starship for the agency's Artemis program. On March 23, NASA announced that it plans to support the development of a second privately built crewed lunar lander through a contract named Sustaining Lunar Development. 
Additional lander concepts will be developed for missions following Artemis 3, and they must be designed to outperform the human landing system competition. The craft should have the ability to dock with the Lunar Gateway, take more astronauts and cargo to the lunar surface, and support longer stays. This new plan isn't all that new. NASA originally planned to choose multiple private crewed landers for Artemis to have redundancy and to drive the teams building the vehicles through competition. However, because Congress did not appropriate enough funds to support the development of multiple vehicles, NASA last year decided to rely solely on SpaceX. Dynetics and Blue Origin, the other two finalists for the award, both protested the decision. The Senate Appropriations Committee directed NASA in October 2021 to select a second company to develop a crewed moon lander and assured NASA that the necessary funding would be available to support the second lander. Exact funding amounts and other details are expected to be released this week when the White House releases its federal budget request for 2023. This newly announced competition will be open to all American companies except SpaceX. However, Elon Musk's company will be able to renegotiate the terms of its existing contract to perform additional lunar development work. Now, let's move on to the updates from Starbase. The test rig, known as the Can Crusher, which is designed for load tests on super heavy test tanks arrived at the launch site on March 22. It's currently not clear which prototype will be tested on this rig. It could be Booster 7 or any of the other booster test tanks currently stationed at the construction site. You may remember the new triangular booster aero cover we mentioned in the previous video. They were recently installed over Booster 7's COPVs. A new booster thrust puck and a quick disconnect plate were delivered to Starbase recently. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.